Okay, welcome back to the second hour of Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters, and today is Monday. It's August the 5th, 2013. Hannah Crum, the kombucha of Mama, makes a return visit with us this evening. Hannah has been on several times before talking about probiot- the healthy probiotic drink kombucha, as well as GMOs and fermented foods. There's an ancient saying that goes, we become what we think about. And there's an auxiliary saying that goes, we are what we eat. Both, sta- both sayings stand to reason. Health, wellness, and vitality are some of our favorite topics here at Far Out Radio, and it's kind of a no-brainer that our health and vitality will improve if we simply substitute toxic foods for wholesome, clean, real foods. Yes, I'm speaking of organic food. Hannah Crum is with us tonight to talk about some strategies for putting more organic food on your family's dinner plate without damaging the family food budget. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, but organic food is so expensive. We've all heard that and probably said it from time to time. I certainly have. And that's because sometimes, depending on where you shop, organic vegetables and fruits are more expensive. Look, I have passed on some organics because I'm not going to spend $6 for two peppers. But the virtues of organic fruits and vegetables are numerous and well-documented, and making them part of your regular shopping routine can be challenging. Hannah Crum, our kombucha mama, is well known for her work in promoting kombucha and other nutritious fermented foods, but she also has a passion for local, organic, non-GMO food. Now, there's a lot that can be done to integrate better food into our diet, uh, and much of that has to do with just creating a few new buying and preparation habits. So we'll be talking about comparison shopping, how to find local organic farmers, organic co-ops and CSAs, as well as basic as well as some basic canning and food preserves, growing your own food and preparing foods ahead of time so that they're easy to prepare for meals. You know, modern processed foods was a post World War II invention that quickly became the new American way. Yes, that's right, younger folks. Prepared package, pop out of the box and into the oven, saves a little bit of time, but we're paying for it, paying for those conveniences in many, many ways. And really, if you stop and think about it, how much time do you really save with prepackaged processed foods? 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes at the best? All the other things you still have to do, like setting the table, getting the dinner out, the cleanup, doing the dishes, putting the dishes away, etc. But with just a few basic spices, it's very easy to prepare delicious meals for your family. And uh, you can save a lot of money by making things yourself. The money you save, you can use to buy organic fruits and vegetables. Okay, enough of me. Hannah, are you there? Welcome back to the program. Hey, Scott. Glad to be back. Howdy. One of my favorite topics, organic <laughs> food, fruits and vegetables. Uh-huh. So you get your glass of, to... you got your glass of kombucha there? Well, it's... You you know I do. What flavor are you drinking this week? Uh, I'm drinking something that I bottled last night that's got uh, lots of blueberries in it and some oranges. So it's mm-hmm. uh, it's a brilliant red color. Oh, that sounds delicious. I've got, yeah, um, I took some rose petals from my garden and infused them with some fresh strawberries, which are popping up at all the farmer's markets. And it is a really tasty brew, and it's, it's pink. Wow. Hmm. Strawberry yeah, rose. Those rose petals and strawberries will do. Yes, I'm. You know, I'm a big fan of eating our flowers. You know, flowers are our friends, and um, they used to be some of our our drinks uh, before we had sodas and things. We would put flowers and infuse them into water, and then sip on them, and we'd thereby receive that kind of flower essence. And so that's why I really like putting them into the kombucha because all of that kind of good essence gets infused into your juice as well. Have you ever seen the movie Little Shop of Horrors? <laughs> I have. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a it's an old movie. It's about 35, 40 years old. And, and I think there was a scene in there where, where one of the character actors, this guy was a classic character actor who recently passed away, uh, where he eats a bunch of flowers. And I heard him interviewed one time on NPR, and he said they were asking him about the scene where he was eating the flowers. I think he was eating them at a funeral or something. I forget what. But he said, oh, yeah, I love to eat flowers. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> and why not? I mean, I make a wonderful, delightful uh, drink called, with uh, with dried hibiscus flowers. And uh, it's terrific. 
it's slightly tart. Uh, it well, comes out absolutely well. And uh, out here, it's called jamaica, which is uh, that's the Spanish word for hibiscus, and it's one of the jaritos. These are the little drinks that are made traditionally in Mexico mm-hmm. and are terrific on a summer's day because they're just cold and icy, and they're fresh yeah. made. So, uh, like like for that, you're just putting the hibiscus with some water, a little sugar, letting it steep, and it's full of vitamin C. You got all kinds of great um, living energy for you, and it's you know, you control the amount of sugar that goes into it. I put about a, a a teaspoon and a half or so of honey infused in in warm water in with about a in a quart bottle, and then a teaspoon of uh, of uh, chia seeds, and it's a uh, mm. it's a great a great uh, summertime drink. So anyway, so what's for dinner tonight, Hannah? Well, you know it's going to be something organic and fresh. Uh, thankfully, here in California, we have access to this type of produce year-round. We have uh, farmer's markets. So if you live on the West Coast or if you live in a city where there's farmer's markets, that's a really great place to start looking for organic foods. And as we spoke about on our previous shows, there's been a, quite a big movement of farmers who are uh, who are not necessarily going through that organic certification process, but many of them are still pesticide-free. So always chatting with your local farmer's market farmer is a great way for us to get to know them, to strike up a relationship. Now you know who's growing your food. And then secondarily, to ask them these types of questions. You know, when you're at a, a standard type grocery store, there the person in the produce section can't really answer where the food was grown or, or how it got there because their job is just to put it on the shelf. So Came from the it's really warehouse. nice when you can put a face and a name to your farmer or to who's who's actually growing your food for you. I can sometimes I wonder if you ask some of those uh, produce guys, you know, well, where did this come from? And some smart aleck would say, the warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what people think of our food supply. It's just like, I don't know if you saw this the other day, but uh, someone complained that they got a chicken head in their um, package of chicken breast, <laughs> saying that it was really strange that that would show up there. And while I agree it might be strange since the packaging was intended for breasts, it's, it's not too weird when you realize there's a whole chicken attached to that breast, not just um, hunks of meat. Son of a gun. How about that? Isn't that amazing? Did you happen to see on the news today that in London, England, they had the fir- the very first taste test of an in vitro beef. This beef Ew. muscle, this beef muscle, was grown in a laboratory in glass in vitro. That's what that means, and uh, it had a few other ingredients mixed into it. And uh, you know, it's grown in a round glass. So, like, well, somebody must have looked at it and said, "Hey, this we should make a patty out of this." And uh, they cooked it up today, and they served it to a chef from Chicago, and he said it was mighty tasty. <laughs> I'll take his word for it. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'll be eating any Franken meat anytime soon. Oh, um, I know. You know, I, know. I well, look, if something like that were actually viable, I, I don't know. It, it's just it's too hard for me to wrap my mind around, and that might make me sound like someone who's like anti-science. But really, what it is is when it comes to food. And, and healing, I feel like, you know, why mess with 10,000 years of nature and evolution? Um, we have evolved to consume certain types of food to receive our nutrition and living forms uh, from a variety of sources, be that organic meat or organic produce or, or whatever. Um, and those are really the foods that we should be gravitating towards rather than focusing on how can we make something clever, uh, you know, in anticipation of what? I, I'm not fully certain, you know. I know, um, I know. It's just I think too where you weird. and I got where you and I do agree is getting rid of something like a CAFO system where we're not treating animals properly, we're feeding them the wrong type of food, we're pumping mm-hmm. them full of chemicals. You know, I, I think we're both on the same page that that kind of food is not the way we want to be raising animals or treating them or consuming them. Indeed. Hannah, you're so knowledgeable and you're it's like you have this enormous uh, breadth and depth of uh, of knowledge about food and drink and have and preparing and all that sort of stuff. For our listeners that are new to the program, tell us about your journey to this health and vitality perspective and how it began because I know it's been a very interesting step-by-step process for you. It has, and you know it started through kombucha. I know you probably thought of course it did, but um that is really how I, I got into caring more about the type of food I'm putting into my body because at the time that I started drinking kombucha, I, you know, standard American diet, fat, uh, fast food, 
shopping at the grocery store, cooking in the microwave, um, all of those things was, that was my normal life, ramen or pre-made, you know, pre-made foods that you just add hot water to, stuff like that. That was kind of my diet. Um, and I found that was a pretty normal diet, you know, being a, a middle-class American uh, girl from the Midwest, all the middle, straight down the middle, um, you know, that was how I was raised and this is what we ate. So when I first discovered kombucha, I was in, I was inserting it into that type of lifestyle. So there was, I, at that time, I didn't have a specific health concern, but, you know, this was something that my body really enjoyed and I was deriving pleasure out of doing that process. And over time, the more that I consumed the kombucha and the more that it was helping me to kind of feel my body and feel how different foods would make me feel. Um, so it started raising my awareness about different types of foods and dietaries. And um, Hannah, let's pick that up on the other noticing. side of the commercial break, and we'll we'll finish yes. that up. We're talking to Hannah Crum tonight. You can keep up with her work at kombuchacamp.com. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back, and we're spending some time this evening with Hannah Karam, the kombucha mama. We're talking about how to make organic food more affordable, and Hannah's been with us many times before. You can catch all of her previous visits in the archives by using the search tool at the top of faroutradio.com, and do stop by her website. It's kombucha camp, and that's spelled K-O-M-B-U-C-H-A, camp, K-A-M-P dot com. She's got articles, videos, and all the supplies you need to get started making kombucha. And by the way, Hannah, before we get back into your story, this week is our one-year anniversary of making kombucha. So there. Yay! Happy yeah. kombucha birthday! Indeed. Indeed. And I still have That's that awesome. scoby. I still have your scoby there. It's working good. <laughs> Mama, generations later, it's still humming along. I love to hear that. Actually, well, it has been, spread um, out. It has spread out now into two more jars. I, I have a two and a half gallon uh, uh, ceramic crock with a spigot in the front, sits up on a little pedestal, and then I have uh, a Karen found two of those sun tea jars, those glass one gallon jars with a little spigot in the bottom. So we've we've got the three of those guys working, and they're all they're all cooking away there from the from the uh, mother scoby we got from you. So thank you. And kombucha has a way of doing that. It just starts to multiply in your life. So that's yeah. good. I'm glad to hear that you have grown likely in concert with your consumption patterns as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Initially, um, just the, the two and a half gallon crock was, was plenty. It was enough. But the more we developed a taste for kombucha and then just wanted to drink more, uh, I got a, I got another gallon container. And then just recently, we got the, the second extra gallon. Had to get another uh, one. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Okay. We're, we're... <laughs> well, the night. Nice, yeah, so we'll pick up with our story. Our story, and to to make a long story short, basically, just as my body started coming back into balance, it became easier for me to hear the messages that it was giving me. Which is, when I consumed certain foods, I felt great. When I consumed others, I didn't feel as good. And then, of course, um, as I'm learning about kombucha and getting more into the science of it, and realizing that we're bacterial sapiens and the like. Um, you know, it started to make more sense, like, oh, so microwaving things and rearranging those molecules, that's not only not benefiting me, it's it's basically harming my food and making it something that I don't want to consume. So it was just through a very gradual learning process and discovery of other nutritious foods, such as sauerkraut, such as raw milk, such as grass-fed beef and the benefits of eating grass-fed versus um, conventionally fed meat and things like that that this knowledge has has built within me. So this this wasn't something I just picked up all at night. And that's what I'd like to tell people out there who may be new to organic foods is don't try to replace everything all at once. Start slowly. Start with something that maybe you eat the most of and, and figuring out, you know, one thing that you can start to replace in that way and, and then gradually do it from there. Um, I know a lot of people starting out, they get sick or shocked looking at those prices, and, and it can feel frustrating, like, I want to do the right thing, I want to feed my family, but I'm on a budget, and how am I supposed to balance these two seemingly opposed concepts? And, um, you know, there's a lot of fun ways in which we can do that. Um, do you Did you go organic all at once yourself, Scott? A little bit at a time. Uh, one of the things that helped me weed out a lot of the processed foods was about six or seven years ago when I heard uh, Dr. Russell Blaylock on with Jeff Rentz talking about his book called uh, Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills. Uh, and the, the book mm -hmm. is – 
was an expose on um, natural flavorings and uh, monosodium glutamate, our old favorite uh, MSG, and uh, the proliferation of of uh, MSG and uh, natural flavors is just another word for MSG. But these almost all uh, processed foods have MSG in them, so I kind of went on a went on a mission. I, I started to take my reading glasses with me to the supermarket so I could read the fine print on the labels. And I was shocked. I, that was sticker shock for me more than the than the six dollar peppers. Uh, when I saw that just about all of my favorite foods, my favorite packaged foods, uh, had natural flavors in them. And I just made a decision that I'm not going to uh, vote with my dollars and buy products that are what I called loaded. I mean, there was a reason why I found myself craving another cup of coffee with my uh, Amaretto coffee mate because there's natural (laughs) flavors in there and it's so good. And I just said, I'm not going to do that anymore. And um, uh, so I wasn't buying those kind of products and it made – it made the slightly more expensive carrots and, and uh, romaine lettuce and the other uh, fruits and veggies more affordable because I wasn't buying the other stuff. And that's a, that's a great technique to do. And it's hard because, you know, we live in the 21st century and we've grown accustomed to certain foods and think of them almost as friends. But And I'll say this as many times as I, ha- as I have to, but poison in pretty packages is still poison. It certainly and is. And the people who are, um, you know, who are selling those to you probably don't even consume them. They're, you know, they're selling an image, they're selling an idea. And if you buy into that idea and image, you end up selling your, your health out short because you end up putting things into your body that your body can't use. So I think going gradual is a really important step. And also, as you said, start reading your labels. I mean, it, it can be depressing at first because you feel like, oh, no, everything that I love or that I'm used to eating has has something in it that I shouldn't be eating. What do I do? Again, it's good, better, best. It's making, you know, if you're making good choices, make better ones. If you're making better choices, try to make the best choice from now and again, you know. But it's a continuum. It's It's not something where you have to flip a switch and everything has to change overnight. But the more gradually you can do that, um, the better off you are. Now, I also have a garden. So a lot of my herbs, um, I also grow tomatoes and things like that, and I'm planning on doing a, a bigger garden come this fall. But one of the, the gardening techniques I wanted to check out, have you heard of this? It's called square foot gardening. Yes, um, it's, it's been a around for a long time, garden. but it's... Yeah, have no, you it's done a great it before? Way to have you tried this? I tried it many you years ago. Did you get a higher yield? I, or? Um, I, I was doing it very small, but it, uh, what surprised me was was how much easier it made uh, weed control and, and it just made it more manageable because there's uh, – if uh, if you want to have a, a – a dark gardening experience. Just start a regular garden, especially if you're here on the East Coast, and wait till August when the humidity and the bugs start to set in, and that's when the weeds start to take over. And it could be so nasty out there doing your weeding and your and that kind of stuff that you won't want to do it. And the square foot gardening just makes it a lot simpler. So we've got some music playing. We're going to take a little bit of a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk to Hannah Crum about going shopping, going food shopping, what to look for, uh, what to uh, what to avoid, and uh, some other fun tactics for uh, getting some more organic fruits and veggies on your family's dinner plate. We'll be right back in just a few minutes. Okay, we are back, and Hannah Crum, the Kombucha Mom, is with us this evening. We're talking about ways to make organic food more affordable, how to get more of it on your family's plate without busting the budget. Okay, Hannah, where were we when we took our commercial break? Uh, well, we were talking about uh, what what we can incorporate into our diets that are more organic, how to get more of those organic foods in. You know, there's a really great resource out there. I've probably mentioned it before in regards to other things. It's called the Environmental Working Group, EWG. And one of the things that they put out is this great guide. It's called the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. And what they've done is they, they go through and they test the level of pesticides on all these different fruits and vegetables, and they've determined that there's about 12 of them that are, you know, you definitely want to get an organic version because for whatever reason, they're more susceptible to absorbing the pesticide. And usually this is because it's being sprayed right onto the skin and maybe the skin is something we eat. So, for example, on that list, you find things like berries, 
and peaches and apples. So these are things where pesticides are sprayed right on the skin. And you know, when you reach for that apple, you're like going to bite right through the skin and everything. And so that's something you want to be more mindful of. And, and those types of things, we definitely want to swap those out for organic versions. Now, the good news is is that um, there are some fruits and produce that for whatever reason, and we'll see that reason, is basically they have a skin that's a little more impervious, and so we can get a non-organic version of that and not be as worried about um, the pesticides. Now, of course, choosing organic is always the better choice because you're supporting those farmers and those people who are growing that produce without without pesticides, and that's what we want to do. But like we said, not everybody can make that switch right away. So, for example, some of the things on the Clean 15 are avocados, pineapples, mangoes. So these are things that have a shell or, or a stiffer skin that we can peel that off and then consume what's inside without as much um, risk of absorbing as many pesticides as if we were eating berries or something like that. There's a wonderful tool that can be acquired for as little as about 30 or $40. It's uh, it Basically, it's an ozone generator. Um, you can also buy ozone generators that are a little more uh, sturdy for uh, several hundred dollars. But what's very, very interesting about ozone, these ozone generators is that they have a lot of uses. They can be used to do clean the air uh, with the ozone. And ozone is just oxygen with an extra oxygen molecule attached to it. Um, ozone can be uh, blown into water. And uh, what I used to use my ozone generator for, and I have to get another one because it broke, uh, what I used to use my, one of the things I used my ozone generator for is as I was making a, a large salad, I would put a bowl of filtered water in, or get a large bowl, fill it up with filtered water, and as I was cutting up my fruits and vegetables for the salad, I just put them into the water while the ozone uh, generator was blowing air through a little rubber hose and a stone aerator so that I was treating the uh, the fruit that was sitting in the water to an ozone bath and uh, as an extra way of, of uh, cleaning the, uh, the fruits and vegetables for my salad. Just another good way, another little subtle thing you can do, a little tricky thing you can do to get some of the, you know, the residues off the fruits and vegetables that you're eating. That is pretty clever. And so the, the extra molecule of oxygen would then adhere to whatever – you know, toxic molecule, and it that's just how basic, it would get rid of it. It just, it just basically gobbles it up and it's gone. Uh, wow. Ozone generators are used uh, for uh, room purifiers. Uh, they get rid of all kinds of stinky smells uh, because the oxygen, you know, it basically just uh, oxidizes uh, uh, bacteriums and viruses, makes them go away, kills them. Uh, because uh, 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 nasties, uh, nasty bacteriums cannot uh, survive in a, in a highly oxygenated environment. They don't like it. So, but anyway. Isn't that interesting? They yeah. like dark, dank, creepy places, and that's yes, why we gotta get, we gotta bring all, we gotta bring the truth out into the light, right? We gotta bring all this information to light so that people, you know, can can grasp it. I, it's so exciting. I love when metaphors mix yeah. like this. But um, another great way to even identify is my produce organic or not is by looking at the sticker. Uh, nice. A lot of the labels, the fruit labels, they carry what's called a PLU. It's a little number that indicates where it came from. It's got all kinds of information on it. And these days, if that number, it's typically four digits. If it's a four-digit number, it means it was grown conventionally with pesticides, which is I wish the convention was without pesticides, but that's the world we live in. If, the, if it's a five-digit number starting with the number nine, then it is organic. And lately, the sticker also reflects that information as well. But if you're picking through a pile of stuff and you're looking at the different PLUs, if you happen to notice that it is a nine or isn't a nine, then that's a way you can kind of have a clue that it is or isn't organic. Now, if it starts with an eight, this is really important to pay attention to, it means it has been genetically modified. So those are, you know, eight, not great, nine is fine. That's kind of your little model you want to keep to yourself when you're when you're uh, taking a look at all the different fruit at the produce section. And if you're buying any prepared food, assiduously avoid anything with MSG in it. Um, that stuff just stokes your appetite. You know, I mean, it was many many years ago that. Uh, that Lay's potato chips started uh, with that uh, TV campaign called "Bet You Can't Eat Just One." Well, that's because they knew you couldn't eat just one. I mean, have you ever tried to just eat three Dorito chips? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> 
Like next thing you know, a whole bag is empty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, around here on the East Coast, every fall, and they'll they'll be arriving very soon. Every fall in the supermarkets here on the East Coast, they sell these these delicious ginger snap cookies, and they're called uh, spice wafers, and they are so good. They come in an orange and black box, kind of like autumn, you know, harvest time stuff. Mm-hmm. And there's two two tray two plastic trays in there. Well, as far as I was concerned, that's two servings <laughs> because if you start eating one or two or three, before you know it, they're all gone. And when I looked ah. at the la- when I looked at the label, darn if I didn't see natural flavors. And I went, that's why I can't stop eating those things. And then ju- if you think about just the opposite, have you ever known anybody that binged on apples or carrots? No. <laughs> no. No. No, right, not because at all. they're getting nutrition that their body can use in a form it can it can utilize, and that, and that's what tells the body it's full because it's received what it needs, right. and that's and that's the feedback system that's broken right now, right? See, it, whenever we have closed loop systems, and these are systems whereby um, you know the waste product is able to be reused or whatever that is, when when we're closing the loop on that type of a system, what we're doing is allowing the energy to flow more freely, and when those systems are broken. Right, we have things running off the tracks, and in this case, when people are consuming foods that don't actually nourish them, there's no closing the loop, and they're always hungry because they're not getting the nutrition that their body needs in a form that their body can recognize it. So if we shift what it is we're putting into our system, we're able to close that loop because now we're going to get our healthy fats. Now we're going to, which help us feel satiated. Now we're going to get our nutrient-rich. Um, vegetables and fruits that are organic and not covered in pesticides. Now we're going to get our fermented foods, which help repopulate our healthy bacteria. When we close that loop, we find just as human beings, we have much more energy, we have much more vibrancy, and we don't need that coffee, let alone the second or third cup of coffee. Right. Um, and you won't just eat We can and get away with coffee just being a treat as opposed to a daily necessity. Indeed. Hannah, we're going to take a little bit of a break before we roll into our last segment. We're talking to Hannah Crum tonight about uh, Good Eats, and we'll be right back. Okay, we're rolling into the last segment. Talking to Hannah Crum, the kombucha mama, about uh, organic fruits and vegetables and how to how to get more of them onto your family's plate without busting the budget. Hannah, one of the things that you mentioned was locating uh, local organic farmers, and um, and then there's also the CSA aspect. And uh, you also talked about gardening, and of course, gar- I think gardening is probably the ultimate uh, fail-safe method of making sure that that what you pick to bring in to prepare for dinner is absolutely pure and and clean and good for you, because you buy the seeds, you grow it, and you don't put anything on it. What do you do when you go to a place either you, where you either buy a lot of produce that's that's really good? What do you do to preserve it? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of there's some little gadgets and things out there that help. Like there are these produce bags, and then there's also produce keepers. But there's a lot of really great tips um, from your local farmer, and that's another reason to also try to connect with those people because they have the best information and tips. So, for instance, like to keep your celery and carrots fresh, it's really great to cut those up and store them in water in the fridge. And, in fact, the water preserves them longer than if we just um, keep them in the cold storage. So Put the celery uh, tips in water? Like that, yeah. Wow, Okay. Yeah, you just put it in, you cut it up, you put it in the water, and the water helps keep it cold and crisp and doesn't allow it to deteriorate in the same way as if we just leave it in there. Um, for strawberries, I've, I've learned that um, just leaving them in the package, they tend to mold fairly quickly. So if I put down layers of paper towels into um, a container and then I layer them in without washing them, you want to keep them unwashed. Once you wash them, they start to um, deteriorate even more quickly. So unwash and then do that through layers. And what that does is as they naturally excrete a certain amount of moisture, instead of causing them to molder, that moisture gets captured by the paper towels and you're able to lengthen their life. Uh, Of course, canning and preserving, those are also great ways to lengthen the life of of what's in season. And um, there's so many books and websites and there's so much information out on the web right now about 
preserving foods in this way that it's it's really exciting to see this kind of rebirth of our preservation movement. You know, probably your grandma made fresh applesauce or whatnot for you. Um, I know my grandma sure did. Absolutely. And it was always mysterious and yet fun to receive these um you know, homemade ball jars of, of, of cinnamon spiced applesauce that was made by grandma, made with love. And um, well, I think we're starting to see a resurgence in that movement again. People are realizing that this is something that's fun and it isn't just something you do by yourself. You can reach out to friends and have a little canning party and, and do it together. And that, that builds community. It also um, is exciting to receive a homemade gift or a gift from from someone who's made it themselves, and it just adds that whole extra level of personal touch to it. Mm-hmm. Plus, uh, the, can, the, the, preserve? Uh, last uh, last time or the time before you were with us, you were we talked at length about uh, fermenting foods. Yeah. Are you using that for preservation? Do you make like, do you do dilly beans or, you know, there's so many people they like to um, either preserve them in vinegar, which is a pickling process, or fermenting them, which is uh, another way to preserve it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, for so for me, you, per- what do you like to do, Scott? Well, for for us personally, um, doing the kombucha is um, that's about all I have time for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I gosh, I exactly. sometimes sometimes I long for the old days when I had a you know a normal life when I had a had a regular job. You know, because when you have a regular job as opposed to being self-employed, your life is structured. You know, you get into a routine. You know, I have to be there at eight thirty or whatever start time is, and you know that. You know, you you get up and you get ready and you go in, you do your thing, and you come home and you're you're home and okay, well now it's my time. Uh, and then the weekend is your time. But when you're self-employed and especially when you work out of your home, uh, your work never leaves, and there's a tendency to you know be at it all the time. So. Well, what you're hitting on right there, um, Scott, is planning. And, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, I know exactly what you're talking about. And when, like you said, you live close to your work, it can be really difficult to set that up. But that's why planning is so important. And, um, you know, this is something that I'm getting into myself. It's not something I'd say I'm an expert in by any means. But um, when you plan your meals and you can kind of say, hey, well, I know we're going to have X amount of leftovers on this day. Well, oh, let me transform that into, you know, tomorrow's chicken salad for lunch. You know, it, it becomes a lot easier to manage the different foods that you're eating for that week. And you can keep on budget better. You know, if you're just grabbing whatever convenience foods off the shelf, not sure what's you know who's going to eat when where what then it can be difficult to to economize in that way but like some people they have uh, little cooking clubs where themselves or their friends one day a week they'll get together and they'll just make like you know a bunch of casseroles and those all get saved up into the freezer or put into the fridge and now you have essentially a prepackaged food but you made it yourself and so you know what all the ingredients are and when you go to heat it up preferably not in your microwave uh, when you go to heat it up in the oven or in the toaster oven or the pan, you know exactly what it is you're putting into your body, and it's not some, uh, are there natural flavorings in there or what other weird chemicals are in there that they're pretending are something else. I used to love that that, ru- that rice product that comes in a box from San Francisco. And that, <laughs> yes. stuff, that stuff was so good. I mean... I just could sometimes I got it got to be so bad that I would make two I get two boxes and put it together because mm-hmm. you know one or two helpings just wasn't enough and it wasn't until I figured out that you know what that what's really in that flavor packet uh that that that's what was stoking my appetite and um uh, and yeah. when you you just Absolutely. mentioned about preparing things and then freezing it um you know I mean I grew up in the in the post war years uh, in the era of the invention of the TV dinner, and I loved those things as a kid. It was just so much fun, you know. Especially those hungry man dinners with the with the peach cobbler in the corner, you know. Oh, it was they so had everything. Good. The dessert, <laughs> yeah, and and prepackaged uh, lasagnas and and this that and the other thing. But but honestly, how much time do you really save? Because you still have to do all the other stuff. Got to set the table and right. get all the bowls out, and then you still got to clean up all the dishes. So, I mean, how much time do you really, really save? Not that much, actually. Well, that, and then you're creating all this extra garbage, and you know, and again, we're putting money into the pockets of 
corporations and businesses that don't necessarily support your best interest or support your health in the same way. Because if they did, they wouldn't put that stuff in there in the first place, right? And well, I understand I just... to a certain extent they're trying to extend shelf life, but, you know, if the shelf life is so extended, what's that doing inside of your body then? Well, when I figured out that, that most of my – all my favorite – well, all of my favorite foods – were were loaded with these additives that were stoking my appetite. It actually made me a little mad because I thought, you know, here I am, you know, sometimes kind of beating myself up for, you know, not being able to control my appetite. But, you know, you can't control your appetite when you're eating those kinds of foods. And when I got rid of them, I gradually weeded them out of my life and started eating more raw, natural uh, fruits and vegetables and unprepared uh, things like that. Um, my appetite went back to normal. And I found that, geez, I don't have to keep buying larger pants. <laughs> That's a nice thing. Well, too. and you're hitting some, you know, you're you're hitting a really important point here, which is that obesity isn't simply overeating. It's not just you can't put the fork down. It's the foods that you are consuming. First of all, there's there's little to no nutrition in them, so your body's not receiving what it needs. So. You haven't closed the loop in that regard. Your body's still seeking nutrition, but if you don't know that that's what your body is looking for, you think, oh, I'm just hungry. Couple that with, as you said, those chemicals that create that kind of dependency, and you're constantly reaching for more Doritos, but if you have no nutrition in those Doritos, you're you're basically uh, overweight and starving, malnourished. Right, because your your body isn't getting what it needs in order to have the enzymes to for healthy cell growth, to have what it needs to build healthy tissues. You know, overweight and undernourished is a common problem that we're seeing, and it, it's not just simply a matter of self control. Mm -hmm. You mentioned enzymes, and that's another one of the pluses uh, when you start to eat more raw fruits and vegetables is the fact that because they haven't been exposed to heat uh, over 100 degrees, uh, when you're eating that bowl of salad, you're not just eating vegetables. You're also eating the vegetables plus all the essential amino acids that go along with the raw fruits and the vegetables. And that's the stuff that your body needs to do repair and regeneration work essential amino acids and when you cook when all you ever do is eat cooked foods fruits and vegetables uh it's essentially dead stuff but you're not giving your body the essential amino acids that it needs to do the repair work to keep you young and handsome <laughs> or young and beautiful well in your like case you. that definitely handsome yeah or young and beautiful like you <laughs> so what's new yeah, what's, we, we got about and that, and We've got about a minute left. What's, yeah, uh, what's, left. what's new with uh, kombucha for you you'd like to mention? Well, um, we've got these really great American-made vessels that people are raving about, um, so we're really thrilled to, with their response to that. And, you know, we're, we're continuing to add to our cultures that we have available. So um, although we are kombucha camp, we do also have kefir grains, milk kefir, water kefir grains available, and we're going to be adding um, jun culture soon. So jun is, is a... It looks like a SCOBY, but it's actually a lactobacillus dominant culture. So, and it feeds on green tea and honey. So, we're going to have a bunch more of these cultures popping up, getting people excited about incorporating healthy bacteria in many different ways. Um, living cultures, Great. living foods, that's really what we're excited about. I'm so, get some these are never dehydrated, that. they always come to you fresh. I'm going to get some of those kefir cultures from you. So something yeah. I'd like to, to give a, give a try. And by the there's our music, so we're going to have to wrap it up. But by the way, that video that you put up showing the uh, the artisan making the uh, uh, the Crocs, uh, very cool. Mm. You know, it's just never you never really think about. So how do these things get made? If you've ever wondered, folks, how a how a for real ceramic, honest, you know, a good one gets made, you know, go to go to a kombuchacamp.com. That's K O M B U C H A K A M P, and look for that video. It's on there, and it's it's very very cool. And you might like to buy one too. Hannah, thank you very very much. It's always a delight to talk with you. You too, Scott. Thanks so much. You're quite welcome, and we'll, we'll do it again soon. Take care. That's our program for this evening. Tomorrow night, we have a new guest, uh, Heather Callahan, whose writings and essays appear on Waking Times and a few other websites. And tomorrow night, we'll be talking about 12 different approaches for mood boosting. Everybody could use a good boost in their mood, so that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow night. Thanks a lot. Take care. Be well. Be back tomorrow.